Hello, colleagues, and welcome. Welcome to the next DINCAST, where today I'm delighted to be joined by the very wonderful Claire Harvey, um, an inclusion and culture guru who I've known for a few years, and she's an absolute hoot, but really, really passionate about the whole inclusion, diversity, and cultural agenda. And I think it's really important that um, we have a look at that uh, at this moment in time, as a lot of you are looking now to build your post-pandemic organization and this is a real chance to have a look at your inclusion and diversity agendas here as well so Claire welcome along thank you very much great to be here I only joined because I thought it actually said dim cast so I thought the bar was going to be quite low now I'm a little bit nervous <laughs> well as I say it, it's me that's the talking head on this so you're probably right in that respect but for those people who don't know you um uh do you want to tell us a little bit about your your, your story your journey and how you've ended up um working in this space sure so um I am either the trailblazer of a portfolio career or I can't stay at a job very long. You can decide which. Um, I'm a psychologist by background. I um, actually spent most of my career in the prison service as a prison governor and a hostage negotiator and riot commander. Um, and alongside that, I was the prisons and probation inclusion expert. Um, after I had an accident, left me as a wheelchair user, and that meant I had to recreate myself in terms of work and it was just at the time of the financial crisis and um, the financial regulator in the UK was looking for someone to understand the culture that had led to the financial crisis not the money stuff um, but the actual culture and, and the drivers around that so I did that for a couple of years really enjoyed it and um, learned the, the skill of taking a concept and understanding an organization when you don't understand the context that it's in. You only need to look at my bank account to know what I do not know about money. Um, and then I moved on to KPMG, where I was um, head of um, culture and inclusion. Um, and then I set up my own consultancy um, where I help organizations all over the world, big, small, um, global brands, very small businesses, to really think about how inclusion and culture can help them create an, what we call a thrive culture. So create an environment where people work hard, really want to be there, really feel like they belong and um, to attract the broadest talent and importantly, to drive that high performance culture. So we'll come to sort of, a, I suppose, a year's anniversary since the pandemic really hit. And I just wondered, you know, on your reflections over the past year, um, how has this, this impacted on your thinking about business and leadership and, and where your thinking is for the future? I think it's been a really interesting time um, from a business point of view, because I think it's pushed a lot of businesses into spaces where they thought they could never go. The amount of times I've spoken to clients who were like, no, we could never have people remote working. It would never work. Our systems and structures aren't set up that way. And here we are. And they're having to do it. Um, I think it's really brought home the dividend of um, what I call good leadership so leadership of people rather than just management of things and how to hold people and take people with you during times of huge uncertainty huge emotional turmoil you know let's not forget many people have lost family members lost loved ones um, and also actually really predict the future a bit better than I think a lot of organizations have done historically. So it's a shame that sort of, you know, it's taken COVID to get leaders to start to think about their, you know, inclusions and equality sort of policies. But we, we are where we are with this. And I just wondered in terms of the work that you're involved with and your approach to this, you know, how do you think organisations and leaders can start to really address this and build back a better business um, post pandemic? So I think there's a couple of things that companies can do. I always encourage companies to not keep talking about the new normal because the current situation is not normal. We're still in a pandemic. Therefore, kind of basing your future on what you're doing now probably is not a good strategy. Um, to, I think it's really brought to um, a lot of businesses, both in terms of their workforce, their potential workforce and their customers in whatever customers look like. It's brought home the um, inequalities and therefore the groups that they need to work much harder to service. It's not we often talk. You hear people talked about underrepresented groups. They're very rarely underrepresented. They're just not serviced in the same way. So I think it's highlighted to organizations the need to have a much more targeted um approach to meeting people where they are rather than where you'd like them to be um, and I think the other thing is um, the, the real message going forward is 
to actually take some of the things that have worked now, to take some of the things that you need to have pulled back from before the pandemic and to put them together rather than focus on just going, staying as you are or going back to how you were before. It's an opportunity to see where things have worked and um, recognizing that there's still a level of uncertainty. Um, and actually we need all need to be a bit more agile and cope with that uncertainty a little bit better. So if I'm a leader or uh, my members in, in large housing organisations are looking at this, you know, if you go into one of these organisations, what would sort of be your initial approach or questions to uh, these organisations to help them get started? So I think for me, inclusion should never be the thing that's an add on at the side of an HR strategy that is the nice to have the moral argument thing. It's about solving um business solution, solving business problems and driving high performance. So really understanding where inclusion fits in their wider strategy, what they're trying to achieve as an organization and where inclusion can be a solution to that rather than seen as the extra thing they've got to do as well. Um, and I think that changes the conversation so that inclusion becomes an enabler um, rather than an additional, um, what they would see as burden. Um, I think the other thing is to think about where where is their workforce now in terms of representation in terms of um, sense of belonging in terms of engagement um, and in terms of breadth and sustainability as well are they developing really sustainable talent pools are they making sure that you know they're agile in the way that they work with people because this isn't just about the pandemic of course on top of the pandemic we've got the te technological transformation we've got you know the changing way that people want to work and um, the increase of the gig economy and things like that and so really thinking about all of those things in in a line and seeing where inclusion fits into all of them um, and then really creating a tangible plan to make it happen, embedding it into everything that they do. What we often find in inclusion is they do a lot of initiatives. International Women's Day is coming up in March. Lots of organisations will launch things about women, but then three or four months later, people won't be able to tell you what it is. It certainly hasn't been sustained change. So focusing on embedding inclusion into sustained change, recognising where you are and you can't go from you know, underrepresentation to perfect overnight. It takes time, it's small nudges, but recognising why it's relevant to you, I think it's really important. Yeah, I think you raise a really good point there about actually, you know, not just introducing another change washing programme um, that, you know, actually we've done this now, we've done inclusivity now. Um, I mean, you obviously you work with lots and lots of sort of very, very large clients and, and some of the smaller ones as well. And I just wondered from your perspective, which one do you look back on or do you look up to and think, actually, we really got it right there. This is an organisation who truly has embedded inclusivity uh, within their, their sort of DNA. I think lots, actually, uh, in lots of different ways. Um, so um, a, a big telecom company, I can't, probably can't say much more than that, um, has really taken to embedding things like domestic violence policies and um, well-being policies and not just making them the standalone, oh, if someone's got a problem, we have to do this thing, but really using it to increase engagement, increase attraction um, and increase retention and make it really real in lots of global com um, global settings rather than just an add-on. Um, a big global brand that have ears um, have um really taken inclusion and used it as a tool to drive public trust and increase um, consumer brand um, and reputation and, and make it again make it genuine not have here's the things we normally create and here's the inclusion things but really embed inclusion into lots of things and then I've worked with very small organizations who often have a huge advantage because they can be much more agile um, to really shift the workplace representation and the ways of working to mean not only do they have more diverse people around the table but they're actually leveraging that diversity to make better decisions and come up with innovation and come up with changing ways of working that work better for everyone. I mean there is a really interesting point there about customers and customers sort of driving this do you get a sense of that you know that the, the the covid crisis has now made uh consumers or customers um more uh, aware of the need for organizations who they buy services from to be inclusive and uh you know have that within their their business model 
I think it's definitely um, helped. I think also, of course, if you remember the summer and the, you know, the tragic killing of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, that really raised at a time when people were already anxious and were, were spending more time at home. Therefore, even though there was an almost identical killing six years prior that no one hardly ever mentioned other than people like me who care about equality way too much probably um you know it really was a perfect storm in terms of raising that awareness and i think that's really helped too and what we saw in that space was a lot of organizations who were too frightened to say anything because they didn't want to say the wrong thing or they didn't know what to say and and in the inclusion space not saying anything is a position um but also organizations who said lots of things and then people were able to say, well, what are you actually doing? That's a lovely sentiment, but what's behind it? And I think that's the change. People are being less and less fooled by the policy document, the, the statement, the strap line, the glossy, the glossy kind of portfolio of one of as many coloured people on the front as you can possibly get. And they're wanting to see tangible changes. One question I wanted to sort of ask is, again, with the explosion, because we're all working from home now, uh, the explosion in sort of social media and that way is a way of communicating within an organisation. I just wondered, you know, I suppose the phrase that's used is everyone now has a voice. But has this made it easier or harder to actually get heard because there are so many channels through which people are expressing views and opinions? I think in some ways it's made it easier. Um, I think it's really important when we have these conversations to remember that, you know, everyone still doesn't have a voice. There are lots of the community who still don't have access to digital. Um, there are lots of people who aren't working from home because they still have to go to their place of work. And I think we can really quickly forget those. And I would say, actually, from an organisational point of view, um, it's really important to not forget those people and to create hybrid environments. So it's not just working from home or working in an office. It's actually bringing some people who are home based, some people who are in a space, some people who are out and about, particularly in you know the housing industry, of course, um, and actually create a culture that works for all of those rather than have three separate set groups of people. Um, but I would say more people have got a voice, but actually the way that social media is set up, um, if you think about what we do, we follow those algorithms, we follow people that we like. I think it's becoming harder to hear different views. So, Claire, I mean, obviously, this has been a really difficult year for a lot of people. Um, but uh, to be effective, you've got to look after yourself. And I just wondered from your perspective, you know, what sort of ways do you make sure that uh, you take care of yourself so you can perform at, the, at your best? So I think it's really important that um, we kind of try and keep to routines as much as we can. And I think when people are more home based, um, there's a tendency, particularly if you're working at home, um, that, the, that you can kind of extend your entire day and things morph into one. I, I was joking with a friend the other day saying, um, you know, when you were young and you had your underwear with the days of the week on, like how helpful would that be right now? Um, but I think, um, so I think that concept of, you know, starting the day so I take the dogs for a walk at the start of the day and I give myself permission to end the day at the same time that I would end the day normally um so I and I then walk the dogs at the end um so that it kind of it creates that routine that you would normally have and I think that takes two things it takes um permission to do it um, so that you don't feel like you're doing it, but you secretly might need to look at your emails or even you might have to make up things to really say why you're not there. But I think it's important as a leader that you also role model it for other people as well and give them permission to do it as well. Otherwise, people are just working harder and longer. And that's that doesn't it's not good for them and it's not good for outcomes either. I think the other thing is just um, practicing some gratitude. And I don't mean that in a toxic positivity. There's always someone worse off than you way because I don't think that helps. But really trying to be in the moment and positive about the things that I'm grateful for. So, you know, no one in my family has been impacted. I'm still healthy. You know, we've got a, um, we, I, I saw a great tweet the other day that said, don't complain about working from home because it means you've got a job and you've got a home, you know, and I think sometimes that sense of perception when you're moaning that you can't go where you want to go or you can't go to your favourite restaurant, I think sometimes you need a bit of a reality check. And then a third thing I think is um, that sense of you can do what you can, but your expectation of yourself and what you assume everyone else expects from you 
is probably not steeped in any level of realism enough. So recognizing that some days, you know, good enough is good enough um, and giving yourself, not being so harsh on yourself. Yeah, I think some really, really good advice in there, Claire. And and um, sort of, you know, we've come to the end of our time together. And I just wondered if there was one thought you wanted to leave leaders with who are thinking about, you know, the whole inclusivity and equality agenda around this. You know, what's the one takeaway you'd want them to uh, to think about from this uh, this interview? I would say two bits because I'm greedy. The first is diversity is all around you, whether you are choosing to see it or not. So, you know, really focus down on move away from managing diversity to practicing inclusion, because that will leverage the diversity you've probably got around you that you're not knowing. And it will drive diversity to come towards you. See too many organizations chasing diverse people, um, but they're not thinking about the environment that they're coming into and people don't thrive and they don't stay and it becomes that kind of wheel um, and that's not good for anybody. And the second thing I would say is get comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, I think in the world of leadership, we're used to being experts of things. We're used to only talking about things we know about. We're used to, in the business world, wanting some level of certainty and a plan and, and, and you know, the pandemic is showing us that there's levels of uncertainty that are outside of our control, but also... The world of inclusion is about seeing the world through other people's lenses and recognising that your view, your understanding isn't always the right one. Fantastically wise words to finish with there, Claire. Look, I always enjoy chatting to you. You've always got some fantastic uh, insights and, uh, you know, pearls of wisdom uh, to sort of share. So thank you very much for your time today. And I look forward to working with you again in the future. Great to see you. Speak to you soon.